Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the SUNY School of Public Health and Health Policies, uh, Harlem Health Initiatives Skills Building Webinar, Responding to Our Community's Health and Literacy Needs, a Skills Building Webinar. We're grateful today to have two of my colleagues from the School of Public Health here to provide us with some um, beginning information around health literacy and health communications. Um, so it gives me great honor and privilege to be able to turn the floor over this morning um, to my um, one of my presenters, Dr. Uh, Spring Cooper. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this morning we're going to do uh, some brief introductions before we get started. And I think we only have um, one person live with us. So Lee, I would love for you to actually introduce yourself too, so we can um, have some more engagement with you. So my name is Spring. I'm a professor in Community Health and Social Sciences at the School of Public Health. And I have a lot of expertise in um, health communication and specifically uh, family communication and um, how to help facilitate um, communication within families as well. So Sasha, I'll turn it over for, to you for a brief introduction. Hi, I am Sasha. I am faculty in the Department of Community Health and Social Sciences along with SPRING. And um, my expertise is in health literacy and my focus uh, similar to spring is on families and um, how families can use their health literacy skills to advocate for themselves and their communities and um, how we can better engage communities in advocate uh, community organizations in advocating for um, its constituents through uh, how they interact with health information. And then um, I'll just pass it around and ask uh, the participants just to tell us a little bit uh, briefly about yourself and uh, what you're hoping to learn from today's workshop. Um, Lee, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Fullington. I'm the health sciences librarian down at Brooklyn College, so I'm faculty down there. So I'm here today to learn more about the health literacy needs for communities because I work so closely with undergrads and also grad students in the nutrition program. And this is a huge concern of theirs, of course. So I'm excited to be here today. Thank you. And Gabriella? Hi. Uh, my name is Gabriela Betancourt. I work with the Latino Commission on AIDS. I'm their director of monitoring, um, evaluation, and learning. And I'm also a recent uh, DRPH grad of uh, CUNY School of Public Health. And um, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in hearing a bit more about um, actually how to sort of assess and evaluate a health literacy um, uh, interventions, I guess, is the best way that I can describe it. So I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you. And so we have a small group live here today, and I know um, some people will be watching this later, but we would love to really um, tailor and work with anything that uh, you have questions about, too. So if you have specific questions about um, things that you're working on, things that you're developing that you would like to bring to this, we would love to work with those too. So I'll pass it over to Sasha now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I so Spring and I are very open to throwing out the slides and making this a conversation if it needs to be that, um, but we can start with uh, the slides. And so we're just going to jump right in on, um, my stuff isn't advancing for some reason. Okay. Um, defining health literacy. And so the main things, uh, or the main skills involved in health literacy is the ability to access, understand, evaluate, and apply information 
relevant to health in um, interactions with healthcare as one engages in disease prevention and health promotion. And as you are well aware, community organizations filter a lot of health information for communities with high rates of low health literacy. Um, they may help people access information and resources or make sure the information that you're accessing is uh, in a manner that is understandable, um, that the information is reliable. And further, the, because of the established trusting relationships that uh, community members have with community organizations, they're almost like the first line of defense when they need health information or they need to access resources. And um, the, they're able to evaluate that health information coming, community members evaluate the health information coming out of the organization as more um, trustworthy. So it's important that the information coming out is in a manner that is conducive to the health literacy skills of the, um, the community. And um, not only is the information more trustworthy, they feel that in, the community members feel the information is more trustworthy, they also are able to, more willing to act on the information coming out of community organizations and, or at least be open to seeking out other information. And health literacy is first and foremost, a social justice issue. It's made up of skills needed to access resources that are inequitably distributed, as well as the skills needed for advocacy for oneself and one's community. And so if we just think about the COVID-19 vaccination rollout and what is um, making it difficult for people to uh, access in high-risk communities to access the vaccine um, and um, the inequities around that, as well as think, just thinking about the pandemic overall and um, how misinformation and trusting unreliable sources have put a lot of people um, at unnecessary risk and caused a lot of unnecessary death. Um, so health literacy matters because individuals with low health literacy have fewer skills to engage in day-to-day -day decision making and behaviors and engaging in behaviors to promote health and recovery. And as a result, they have more emergency room visits, more and longer hospitalizations. They are less likely to adhere to treatment regimens, which puts them at higher risk for death, unnecessary and early death. And so health literacy matters because all of the effects of low health literacy increases individuals' risk for health disparities. And this is just to show the demographic characteristics of individuals with low health literacy and those who are at risk for health disparities. Um, a lot of studies have actually shown that um, health literacy interventions improve or not improve, but in reduce the, um, the health disparities risk. And when you look at health literacy, all the effect of these characteristics of like education, of being low income, a lot, of the, a lot of the effects get washed away. If we target health literacy, we could combat some of the, um, the negative associations between uh, some character, de demographic characteristics and health that we find in when, when studies are conducted. Um, the way we develop health literacy skill, skills actually perpetuates inequity inequities. So the more resources individuals have for engaging in health promoting behaviors, the more they practice the behaviors. And this creates opportunities for their children and their family members to see them practicing these behaviors and to learn these skills from them. And um, they learn and so children are learning how to engage in the healthcare system from a very early age or not engage in the healthcare system from a very early age. And all of this is based on opportunities. So those with less opportunities and resources are in a vicious cycle of low health literacy. And this contributes to health disparities that is intergenerational. So uh, this is important to think about when we try, when we say that we want to make this long-term change, we have to look at the thing, the root, some of the root causes of this change and health literacy is definitely a major contributor. And um, how we respond to communities' health literacy needs is really important. And that was echoed in your, um, both you, Lee and Gabriella's introduction about wanting to know more about how to um, assess health literacy interventions, but also respond to health literacy needs in the community. So 
workshops and programs to improve community members' health literacy skills are really good. But if we go back and, the, and look at the characteristics of individuals who are at risk for low health literacy, they have a lot of other things that might take precedence of um, versus them attending workshops. Um, they are more likely to be hourly employed and um, access to transportation and all those things make it get in the way. So we as community, as a community um, organizations and trusted community members need to take a step back and figure out what are we doing to alleviate the burden of um, health literacy on our community members. And a big part of that is making sure that when they come to us for health information or when we find information that we want disseminated to them, that we do it in a way that is responsive to where they may be in, the, in terms of their health literacy skills. And I'll pass it over to Spring to talk about one way in which we can do that. So I'm gonna go through how do we actually really make sure that we are creating things that are understandable for people. And so I'm gonna go through plain language guidelines and I love plain language guidelines because the name of them really implies exactly what we are doing. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that we are using plain language so that it's just very readable so that people can understand. And I'm gonna go through like what this really means here. So um, this applies to the language, the graphics, the layout, and the organization. So it is more than just the language. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Next slide. Sasha, you need to advance slides for me. Thanks. <laughs> um, so plain language materials. Um, overall, they're going to use images that are very relevant to your audience. So every step of the process and creating the materials really needs to be focused on who your audience is and what is going to resonate with them. So not just an image that you find for free or the first image that pops up in your search, but what is an image that is actually relevant to both what you're talking about and that will make sense to your audience. Um, you're communicating in everyday language and you really limit the information to what people need to know. So if you're providing, you know, just a lot of excess information, it just tends to garble the message. So we really want to limit it and then break down complex information and instructions into chunks. So kind of like we do when we are presenting things in a PowerPoint, you know, we're breaking it down into, okay, we'll put all this into the slide, break that down so that it's the most understandable. Hopefully that comes across in our slideshow. <laughs> Next. So we're gonna go through the principles here. And the first plain language principles are applying them to writing. So when we are creating the actual messages and choosing the wording for our messages, we wanna write in everyday language. So we want to try to avoid jargon, avoid scientific, language that um, people have not heard before. And sometimes we can include that language as well, but we need to explain it and use everyday language first so that we're starting um, where people are, where their knowledge level is. And then if we want to add in some scientific language for any reason, we would make sure to explain that. We want to use action words and active voice. So I want to say exactly what I mean in the clearest, most simply simple way possible. So when I'm using active voice, I'm avoiding using anything in past tense. And so a lot of us were trained in scientific writing um, to write in past tense. That used to be the norm and we were writing journal articles or we're writing you know, for a scientific community. We were taught that things should be written in past tense. Like, you know, I did this, this was done um, and now, we don't write like that anymore, thank goodness, <laughs> because it is, it's a nightmare to read. It's a nightmare to um, make sense of, and it's just not very clear. So we want to be in the present tense, actively saying exactly what's happening, what we mean. Um, shorter words, shorter sentences, the better. So each sentence, if you find yourself putting semicolons or colons, um, that means that's a great place to break that sentence. Go ahead and cut them down because shorter sentences are more readable. Avoid abbreviations and acronyms and write out pronunciation if needed. So if there's a word that is spelled that you really need to use, that is spelled in a way that people might not expect it to be spelled, 
write out the pronunciation of it because people might have heard that word and might actually know the word but might not recognize it in text. So that's another trick to like help teach people um, what what's actually happening in your document there. Next slide. So plain language principles, when we're applying them to design, um, it's similar things, but now we're looking at how things are actually laid out on the page. So we wanna have a lot of white space and wide margins. So you know when you see a page and there's just things all over it, you don't know where to look, you don't know kind of where to start. So we wanna use the white space and use the white space um, to our advantage. So the more space that we use on the page, then the eye is drawn to where the information is. So it gives you your idea, gives you like a little bit of a flow. You can create a sense of flow as you use the white space more intelligently. Um, and you wanna think also about the fonts that you're using, you wanna use the fonts intelligently you want to make sure that you're having like a bold only for titles you want to make sure that you're using typeface that's large enough and easy to read um, not using all caps because that's difficult to read um, and so as you're kind of looking at this and applying these ideas of plain language into the design I think that one of the easiest ways to do this is to like create something and then have someone else look at it. Because when you're creating something, you are you think it's great. And, <laughs> and you also think like, okay, I've done all these things. Um, but as soon as you show it to someone else, some of these things will start to show up. So all of these tips that we're giving you, I would say also like put them aside. And then one of the best things to do is just have someone else look at it and ask them like, is this easy to read? Like, can can you follow the flow of this? Like, where do you look first? Like ask them some of those questions. Um, next slide. Um, tips for writing. So when you're trying to communicate the information, um, there's a lot of tips for things that'll make it easier to get the information across. So one of these things that so you can make it a question and answer format. So if you're putting, you know, what is the reason I want to do this? Oh, it's because of this. It, that like makes it very clear, you know, what's happening. Um, bulleted lists are another way to uh, clearly break down information. Um, if there's any type of interaction, like you could have like a storytelling uh, process where someone two people are engaging there might be some type of like a uh, healthcare provider like giving information to somebody um, all of these things that have like a dialogue can help people also understand what's happening more clearly all just different ideas of things that you could do um, visuals you want to use realistic uncluttered drawings or photos. So sometimes you might see a very beautiful picture, but it just has a lot going on in it. And if there's a lot going on in it, again, that is taking away from this idea of simplicity. So the more complex the images are, the more complex, um, you know, if they're, you're seeing labeling, you're seeing a lot of things happening in the image, um, probably not the best choice for uh, your materials. Um, and then again, really selecting images that are relevant to your audience. So one of the things that we're always going to recommend is when you're creating any type of document is to pilot test it with your audience. So more than just giving it to a friend or having someone else review it, um, actually having somebody of your target audience look at it and, and ask them specifically questions like this, like, what, is, what does this picture mean to you when you see it? Like, what, what does it bring up for you? Just so you can start to really put together what visuals might trigger for people when they see them. Um, and then use labels, use arrows, use things to help direct somebody through the, um, whatever the document is that you're creating. So we can give you all these tips and we can, we can go on for days with <laughs> all tips and recommendations, but we just want to give kind of an overview and then talk about like, what are these different ways that you can look at your document that you've created and say, okay, is this, is this good? Um, so you can assess the reading grade level at the, which the material is written. So you can actually um, use 
uh, a lot of different reading grade level um, formulas exist, but there's one um, embedded in most uh, word processing platforms now. So whatever word processing platform you use, you can usually um, highlight the text and um, ask it for the reading level. Um, and you can also use other ones if you're not using a platform that has something like that, or you could copy and paste it into a word processing platform just to look at the grade level. Um, and the lower the grade level that the reading is, the better. So we recommend like grade seven would be the highest that you would want to have your um, reading level assessed at. And so you really want to make sure that um, anybody that would pick this up would be able to read it. And um, one thing that will help lower your readability, or sorry, your read your grade level score is actually changing word length and changing sentence length. So like I talked about in the plain language design, you're trying to keep those short. So if you're finding that your score is high, start to shrink those things down. So shrinking the sentence length, shrinking the size of the words, those things will both help you reduce that and make it more readable. So here's another thing that um, we are thinking about as we're trying to design materials. And so we really want to make sure that our materials are culturally appropriate. And so this is something that can be hard to do without piloting, which is another reason we want to always try to pilot materials. But um, we want to make sure that everything that is in the document, whether it's images, whether it is um, text, um, and uh, examples that we're talking about. Um, whatever, whatever you're putting in the document, we wanna make sure that it's actually resonating with the audience. So the best idea for that is to pilot it and to also involve your audience throughout the materials development process. So anytime that you can bring somebody in to look at the document to help you to brainstorm what you're actually doing, the better that document is going to end up being. Other things to consider, and each of these actually, we could do our own whole lecture on appropriateness, on numbers, numbers and numeracy, um, literacy skills, um, call to action, like what do you actually want somebody to do after reading this? How do you want to get them there? Um, how are they actually navigating this? So we could design, I could design a whole lecture on like how somebody looks at a page and how they kind of follow and um, what their brain is doing and how they're kind of understanding um, what is happening as they go through a document. And so all of these things are important to consider. And so when you are actually developing something like go back to these ideas and say okay um when i look at this like is it clear where i should be looking first like because sometimes you know we have like beautiful fancy infographics we develop and then it's like all of this stuff might be on there and it can be really difficult to say okay where do i start so if if you're looking at something and it's not clear immediately where to start like use this idea of arrows of numbers of saying okay let's start up here and then follow around to this point on the page um all of these things can help really improve readability And so we're gonna give you just this very simple approach uh, to help you look at a document, whatever it is that you created and say, okay, is this, is this going to be understandable? So this is our most simple version of a checklist to make sure that you have designed something well. So the language is, does both the main message and call to action use active voice? Yes or no? Does the material use bulleted or numbered items in the design to really help you follow that through? Yes or no? Does the material include one or more calls to action? So there needs to be something that you're actually trying to get someone to do. Does the material explain what the numbers mean? So any numbers that are in there should be explained and um, written about in another way so that if somebody doesn't have high numeracy skills, they can also understand um, what is being communicated. And does the material include pictures reflective of the primary audience? And so all of these are scored on a yes to no. And so you can get a total of five if you get a yes for all of those. And so if you get out of five out of five, 
great. And if you get anything less than that, let's go back and do it again. <laughs> so this is just a very simple approach to scanning through anything that you've created and saying, does this have a chance of working well out in the wild? So we're gonna practice. Sasha's gonna unmute herself and <laughs> tell us what we're doing next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going to practice um, with a few of these and um, we, we're gonna practice this one together for sure, but we need to decide if we want to split up for the others or if we should just do them all together. Um, so, Let's look at this flyer that's uh, for a community event. Um, jump in with whatever, what you think is wrong with it, what, if there's anything you like, um, how would you change it? How do you think community members should engage with this flyer? And I just put in the chat, I just put a little um, screenshot of that scoring checklist. So you can open that on your computer uh, next to this also to help you look at this and say, okay, what, what is good here? What is not good here? And then as soon as you wanna say something, just unmute yourself and tell us what you think. <laughs> Go ahead, Gabriella. Okay, hi. So um, I wasn't necessarily looking at the at the the checklist, although I'm really glad you shared the checklist because uh, it's definitely something I'm going to employ. So thank you. <laughs> um, it just seems like there's a lot of letters, almost like when you look at um, when you're getting your eyes tested. So I don't know if it's because it looks like it's like the, the format is centered, um, but I like the font itself. And I, I wouldn't be able to say exactly what like community members that I work with would think, but I think it would, it would be like difficult to see on screen. Maybe not if it was an actual flyer on paper that's sort of talking, sharing information, but definitely on screen. Yeah, that's a good point about the centering of it. Because the entire thing is centered. See, your eyes are drawn everywhere at once. Yeah. Anyone else? So let's go through the, uh, the checklist with it. So, does both the main message and call to action use active voice? For the most part, this is quite passive. And the first thing, you know, we uh, Spring mentioned about plain language is that you should be able to read it once and know what's happening. And this may require reading a couple of times, partly because you might forget you're reading it because it's so much text and it's so jumbled up, but also because the, it's giving way too much information, way more information than you need right now. So it will get a zero for language. Design, Gabriella, you brought up a good point about um, how the information is presented. It's not bulleted or numbered. It's not in a manner that's um, readable. The font is good because the font allows for a lot of white space, but then there's just too much text. So it negates the, the, the um, benefit of the white space. Um, actionability, there is a call to action. Uh, it's buried. It is come, come learn more about how the current pandemic has impacted. So it's inviting people in, but just a lot of text to read before you get there and people may not get there. Um, even the, if the, the heading, you're, by just looking at the heading, you're not sure if this is an invitation, if this is a lecture, if this is a workshop, you're not sure what to expect from the document itself, except that it's gonna be on student mental health during COVID-19. Um, and then, uh, 
the numbers stuff doesn't apply here. There are no numbers in this. And then culture, it doesn't tell us anything about, first of all, we don't even know who this is intended for. We know what it's about, but we don't know who it's intended for. And um, mental health in particular is such a sensitive topic. And if this is in a neighborhood with um, uh, a, a diverse neighborhood with uh, a lot of people, uh, um, racial and ethnic minorities and, and immigrant families who may be aversive to, not aversive is the wrong word, but um, not as receptive to mental health um, topics, then the fact that there's nothing on here that they can feel they can, like, they can connect with means they're just going to walk by it and say, this is not for us. So that's something to pay attention to. So now this is a different version of the fire. So think about, um, and I have the scoring at the side. So score it and then um, just tell us what score you think you would give this one. You don't have to give it a good score. It's don't worry. <laughs> it's a different version. I didn't see it correct. <laughs> So I, I'll, I can jump in. Um, so one, it's obviously like much more clear who this is intended for because it says it right away. Like what you as a parent can do to help your student. Um, I like the image. So it seems like there's at least more of a personal connection that could be made um and the call to action is clear at least for me mm -hmm. like learn more like i know i'm gonna learn if i do this thing mm -hmm. uh, and i again i can't necessarily speak for my community but I think that the community members that I would work with seeing this flyer would resonate. Mm -hmm. Like it's cute, it's clean. Mm -hmm. I, yes. like that, I like that there's like improving being used. So it's mm -hmm. not about necessarily, I mean, I agree with what you said earlier, Sasha, about depending on the community you're working with, it's maybe not necessarily like a receptiveness issue, but an understanding of like certain terms. So mental health may just trigger mm -hmm. something or evoke something, but if it's about improvement or, you know, and then there's kind of like this opportunity to sort of do almost like a little like under the radar teachable moment, like because you're talking about improving mental health, but then you're you're sort of qualifying it by like helping your your students or your child or your, mm -hmm. or you who you're caring for to cope with challenges. Right, right, and that's a good point because the the headline I think could be changed to tips for helping your child cope with, rather than using the words mental health. We don't necessarily have to use the words mental health to, to um, get our message across that this is about coping strategies. And the, image, the images do help with, um, uh, with at least having the, the reader see that you're not necessarily thinking about uh, like psychotropic meds or anything. It's just, it's about self-care and coping. Uh, and I think these images reflect that. But yeah, so the language could be, the language is much better. There are subtle ways it could be improved and it comes back to what, uh, 
what Spring was saying about knowing your audience and piloting with your audience. Because if you sit with your community members, you might say, well, why are we using them with mental health? Um, you can use something else. Sasha, you have a question on uh, Facebook. Um, okay. And they want to know um, if using a particular color of the font is helpful. Like here you have a dark background with light lettering. Does that in some ways help people who may have learning disabilities? Um, I think you want to make sure there's a strong contrast. So no, ye no yellow and orange, not nothing. First of all, nothing that's going to be too reflective on the eye. And then like a strong contrast. If you're going to use a light font, your background should be very dark um, and vice versa. I think it makes a difference. And just thinking about the colors people might like gravitate to based on the, um, the intent. So like the, the, this blue right here is a calming color. Um, and it contrasts nicely with this dark background. And it jumps, so it jumps out differently than this white background with uh, just black writing that feels like just something else somebody wants you to read. Spring, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the if we look at the font on the second one, the the white font it has it does like leave a little to be desired, right? There mm -hmm. is a little bit of kind of um, thickness to the font that I think makes it a little more difficult to read. And so, like that top the top white font looks harder to read to me than the bottom white the font. Absolute bottom, yeah. And you can, yeah. it's really, it's really interesting to like see different fonts side by side and, and like, just actually look at it and be like, which, which one is easier for me to read. Um, and you can actually start to learn, you know, which fonts um, you feel like are the easiest to read and ask other people as well. And I see that there's a question um, from Facebook, how many people should look at the draft? And I would say as many people as you can have <laughs> look at it. So like, like we're just doing right now, we're having a lot of people, you know, just look at these and like kind of pick them apart. And we all see different things. And we're all going to say like, actually, this part, this part's hard for me. And I don't like that we have actually several different fonts on here, right? Like mm -hmm. the fact that we're changing the fonts as we move through the flyer is also confusing to the eye. Like why, why does it have to be so many different fonts? Like having the title be one font and then having the messaging can be one font, that's fine. Um, but having like the top part be one and then the middle and the bottom be another um, is is just distracting, right? So like when we're thinking about, we want the um, these plain design and writing principles, we wanna try to minimize anything like that, any jumping back and forth between fonts. Agreed. Okay. And again, if you think if your audience involves people with uh, a lot of different um, abilities in terms of the vision and um, even language, you want to make sure that they get some eyes on this. So the amount of people depends on how wide um, or how, how diverse your the, your target population is. So if you're if it's a very um, uh, singular group, then you may need two or three people. But if you're, uh, you have a big age range, because that makes a difference um, in terms of visuals, um, or you have people who may just have differing abilities, you want to make sure that you tap into these different subgroups so that whatever you produce is something that is actually um, usable by all. Um, and you're monitoring the chat? So you have another question, which okay. is, um, are there any fonts that are sort of like a rule of thumb to use? Yeah, so we, I, we have that in the slides that spring. Um, I think they're listed. We'll share those tips. 
Uh, let's see. So, serif font. We don't have specific ones, but um, oops, I meant to send this to everybody. Um, there are a few that are kind of um, recommended more generally. I would say like Century Gothic, Veranda, Helvetica. Those are some of the ones that are easier to read. But but I would I would actually like experiment with those. Try ones that um, you you think look good and then experiment and ask other people and ask people in your target population. Um, so yeah, there are some kind of general recommendations, um, but yeah, then do some of your own uh, assessment of that as well. Yes. So we had originally planned to do breakout groups, but I think because people are on Facebook, it probably makes sense to just go through the other two examples we have without breaking up, um, going into groups. What are your thoughts, Ren? Okay, so I pull that slide. Um, <laughs> so this is a um, kind of a poster uh, for procedures for self quarantining. Um, we so you have the checklist in the chat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So take a minute to kind of, to score this and to think through what would you change? Um, I, when I look at posters, I like to first stop and see what my eyes are drawn to and why. And I'm also gonna put this in the chat, so if you, mm -hmm. If you, it's easier to open it on your screen, it might it might be easier to look at it than um, coming through the PowerPoint. If that is better for you, and just assume we're putting this in a common space in um, a community organization in in Harlem. And so you can just put in the chat what score you gave this. And if anyone wants to share by it, even by a chat on, on Facebook, we can just um, read it out. Uh, why they gave it the score they gave it, that would be really good. So from Facebook, you have a four and a three. They said that the font was too small mm -hmm. and that the text in the blue box was too condensed. I think we can see, I mean, I, th I hope that we can start to see like so many things that we can um, talk about here. And uh, while we're talking about that blue box, I mean, we can also tell that there's this dark blue box within the black ink on it. And so there isn't enough contrast there, right? Like already, even if that wasn't a packed information place, it would already be unreadable just because of the lack of contrast. 
Yeah, and even the lighter boxes, the font could be, the text could be a little bit darker, um, especially because they use italics and that tends to be harder to read already. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, we were talking about like not using italics, um, like if you need to bold a certain word or something for emphasis, you can bold it, but the italics are because there's more serifs, because there are more little lines in the actual font. So you can see like, you know, there's all these little curly cues and things that actually happen in the font, which make it almost unreadable, especially at this size, right? <laughs> Right, and then we have to think about how are people getting their information. So if we have, this is a flyer posted, but someone may be um, wanting the information and in a hurry and take a picture, which is quite common for people to do, take a picture of it and walk away, only to realize that they just can't read it because it's just so much there. Um, and we should really be um, developing things that can carry across several media. And we have a couple of comments. Let's see. And Gabriella said she gave it one, one because of the active voice is used, but everything else, not so much. Yeah, and yes, the images are not all relevant, diverse, full community members, and all the text in the blue box on the left. Yeah, the, the images are just speaking to one group of people. So yes, that is problematic. So we have a, um, so this is a different version. And what score would you give this one? And I think Spring's gonna put this image in the, the chat. And this was definitely an issue, a major issue at the beginning of the pandemic where the, the conversation was around social distancing. And then there were flyers posted about social distancing, but uh, first of all, social distancing was a foreign term um, and people didn't know what it meant. And then the flyers posting to explain it were not necessarily um, written in a manner that was understandable to all or even readable to all. So Sasha from Facebook, you have, um, they like the fact that they're, that the people are of different hues and that the material is spread out more across. Um, but someone also posted that the font still seems a little thick in the boxes. Right. Yes, still a lot. I mean, I... I, I would love to hear like all of the different things that you see wrong with this. Like, yes, there's improvements, but also like look at the spacing on and like there's like very little on the left and then there's a little more in the middle and then a lot on the right. Like the whole spacing is just confusing, right? Like you're they're like, why is this not planned out better? <laughs> and let's talk about, I would love to like look at some of the, um, the ways things are phrased. And because I think one of the hardest things to do, I think we're kind of picking on some of the, um, the easiest things, but like, let's look at the language because that is, I think the hardest to do to rephrase things um, and make them the clearest they can possibly be. So like, let's start with just, I mean, let's start with the title, like ways to self quarantine under COVID-19. Like, is that the clearest title for what we're trying to communicate? Does that 
does something, does someone like understand what that is and are they drawn to that? Is that the best way we can communicate that? Um, I can share that. So I see it two ways because if kind of like the purpose of it is to sort of get community members to sort of understand that jargon, like if that's the purpose of this, then I can see how de like defining what like self quarantine means could be helpful. But if the purpose is really to get folks to stay as safe as possible and reduce their risk of exposure, then maybe that's not where you wanna use that actual term. Not sure if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the term self-quarantine is the most accessible term. Like even, um, the, the idea, you know, I think everybody knows the term quarantine by now, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but even self-quarantine, like what, what does that specifically mean? And um, I, I mean, what if it was more like, how can I quarantine when I live with other people? Or, you know, like what, what if we're actually explaining, you know, um, what we're trying to get across in this in a different way so that it becomes this like, you know, kind of question answer type thing or, um, or what, el what else? I mean, there's a million ways we could title that, but like what, what is the most effective way to get people also to even want to look at this? Like as you're walking by it, um it's just it seems like if we're saying oh ways to do this it's like it's it's kind of a little more it's a little more passive like oh ways yeah it's very that. trivial it, it makes it seem like all right you have if you want to this is what you do versus <laughs> like let's keep everyone safe um and i i think you bring up a very good point um spring in terms of appropriateness for a place like uh new york city where very, we, we can just assume that a lot of people do not live by themselves. So a lot of this won't necessarily, the information needs to be tailored better. There's one thing about stay in a specific room, which how, um, <laughs> when you live in an apartment. Um, and then, uh, but this, a better use of this poster would have been to show how you can quarantine and like how New Yorkers can quarantine in a situation that most New Yorkers find themselves in, which is a multiple person household. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, content wise, even the, so it says pay attention to how you are feeling. What does that mean? I have to, I shouldn't have to read further this could just be, um, do you have a fever? Are you coughing? Difficulty breathing? Fatigue? So that you, right away, in my face, it's all the things that I should be looking for. Instead of you telling me, pay attention to what this means. It's still too passive. Yeah, I think um, what, so, I'm gonna assign homework. Uh, <laughs> so um, I would love people to actually really practice like rephrasing things and trying to get the language right and making things as direct and clear as possible. And so, I mean, this is a great one to start with. Like you could practice with this one, you know, just changing each part of this language. Like, how do I make this clearer? How do I make this better? Um, or you can do it with, documents that your agency is using or documents that you have already created, like go back to them and start to edit them. Um, but this one, you know, is pretty, pretty non dense. So it is like a good practice material to like start doing that. Um, but actually going through and changing a document 
um, is just a great exercise, like to also help you start to see all of the problems, like start to see all of the places where there's room for improvement so that next time when you're starting to develop a new one, like it becomes much more easy to start to state things in these ways. Like it starts to become a little more second nature once you've like really gone to the detail of saying, okay, I need to rephrase every single sentence in here. <laughs> like, how do I do that? Yeah. And we, fortunately, we did not get to the, the very dense of the one we had. Um, <laughs> but we will probably still, will still be included in the slides. Um, we, I, before we end, I just wanted to share there are some resources. So these are, um, the first one is a downloadable book. And then the other two are also very like hefty documents on getting um, materials in a format that is accessible to people of all liter health literacy levels. And then I, um, for, the, for the first sample flyer you saw, I got those images off of blackillustrations.com. They have different hues and they have a, a bunch of free images, but then the, the other images are also very low cost, like you can pay $25 for a bunch, uh, uh, a deck of hundreds of images and um, they release all copyright so you can put it on your materials freely. So um, I like using their stuff for that reason and they're constantly upping it there. They have a free, they have a lot of free versions too. Um, somebody's joined. Um, and we can take a, Maybe one or two last questions and then we'll let you go. So Sasha, you have a couple of uh, questions from Facebook. One is they want to know when part two is um, because um, they want to know if they can submit their materials and maybe uh, review them. Um, and someone else says, thank you very much. This has been extremely helpful in beginning the conversation. Um, and they thank you and are going to share this. Um, so the question is, yes, uh, we will be sending out a link um, regarding this recording because they wanna share this with their staff um, who unfortunately couldn't get on the webinar this morning. Um, so we will definitely make sure that uh, the slides and the uh, link to the recording will be shared. Um, for those that are still on, there is in the chat box an evaluation, a survey, if you would share that. Um, and so I want to just see if there's any closing questions. Um, we have a few in the chat box. I want to thank both Dr. Um, Spring and Dr. Sasha for all of the time and energy and your talents and your knowledge that you've shared with us today. Thank you for um, starting this conversation. We really appreciate your time and energy um, for doing this. And on behalf of the School of Public Health and Health Policy, the Harlem Health Initiative, we wish you all a great day. We will make sure that everybody has the recordings. Uh, we will also share um, the email addresses. Um, thank you very much. And if you would fill out the survey, we would appreciate it. Any closing uh, words from either of you? Thank you for your time. And thank you for being as excited about this work as we are. And I guess for, for the question about part two, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, you know, taking this work uh, into uh, wherever you are currently working in your home, maybe um, <laughs> uh, on Zoom into, you know, sharing uh, and getting people working together and creating documents um, and having a lot of a lot of insight, a lot of uh, people working together will really improve that process. So yeah, I invite you to um, create some collaborative teams around things that you're creating and editing. 
thank you again and we will see you soon um, our next event for those that are able to join us uh, the SUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy has in, uh, engaged in a survey around vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so we will be sharing that report with our Manhattan Borough President. I've put that into the chat. So please feel free to register. We'll also share that in the email going out. Thank you again for your time, your energy and your talents, but most of all for caring for our community. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks everyone.